welcome to this bonus episode of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden of Witts University in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, every so often it comes to our attention that not a lot of people are familiar with who we are, why we're doing the show, who's behind the show. Is there any kind of puppet master pulling the strings? You know, you and I have been doing this now for going on, I think, seven years? Yes. We started in 2010. Yes, yeah, seven years now. Um, and every couple of years, we always think it's a good idea to reintroduce ourselves to the audience, in part because we've brought on lots of new listeners. We now have about 600,000 followers across all of our different platforms on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on the podcast. The podcast now has about 30,000 downloads a month, which puts us actually in the top 15% of all podcasts worldwide. So we'd like to thank everybody who's listening to the show right now. But we also think it's important to really kind of talk to you about who we are and introduce our background so that you really have a better sense of where we're coming from, why we've done this podcast, and in part also to dispel any kind of misunderstandings that seem to pop up from time to time. Yes, it's it's very important to make clear actually who we are, because I think so frequently, especially in the China-Africa space, there's a lot of suspicion about the about which governments are funding which news outlets, and you know people aren't frequently aren't very clear about who's actually speaking when you know kind of when they listen to something when they read something about China Africa relations. So this is why we would like to be clear about what we do and who we are. Okay, Kobus, let's get started. We're going to talk about a few topics today. One, we're going to talk about ourselves. Who are we? Where do we come from? What's our point of view? Why did we do this? Then we're going to talk about the China Africa Project and kind of what it is, how it's funded. And, and finally, just kind of we're going to address some of the kind of direct questions and the insinuations that we've get on social media and, uh, and via email. So Kobus, I think the best way to start is let everybody get to know a little bit about yourself uh, you know, tell us a little bit about the Kobus van Staden story. <laughs> not, not a very exciting story, but um, I, I am both an academic and I have a background in journalism. So I've been bouncing back and forth between journalism and, and academia for a long time. Um, I started off in as a filmmaker, as a TV journalist and a filmmaker. Um, then I went to grad school in Japan, where I was uh, in Japan studies, actually Japanese studies, more than Chinese studies. Um, and um, after coming back from grad school, uh, I moved back to South Africa, and I worked as a, as a documentary filmmaker again for about three years. And then I decided it was time to get back into academia. So roughly, roughly about that time, I was, I was very interested in China-Africa relations. Um, I after I came back from Japan, I came to a South Africa where China was suddenly incredibly important and, and really ascendant in the South African economy and South African politics. Um, so I saw something was happening, and I was interested in doing academic work about China-Africa relations, and especially comparing them to Japan-Africa relations. Um, and that was when I was when I started following you on Twitter, um, because you were one of the few people who were who was um, constantly, you know, kind of like tweeting about China Africa relations. Um, and then um, and then actually and then you put out a call that you that you want to restart your podcast. So that was when yeah. I contacted you, and then we started working together. Okay, we'll get to that in a second, but let's you know let's bring up let's get right to it. There's we're going to put everything on the table here. We we really believe in transparency because frankly this is a passion project for us. Um, we have no agenda, and and I mean genuinely we have no agenda. We started this because Kobus and I wanted to have a good fun discussion. We said early on if nobody actually listens to our podcast, that's actually okay because we enjoy talking about these issues and talking with really smart people. So when I mean we have no agenda. Really, the only – that's actually not true. The only agenda we have is to have an engaging conversation. But, okay, with that said, Kobus, you are white, correct? Yes. Okay. You have gotten some feedback over the years from people who say you're not African. How do you respond to that? It's – you know, look, I, I I can see where they're coming from, and um, you you know, when I was living in Japan, people always ask me where I'm from, and then I told them, and then they're like, no, but where are you really from? Um, so you know, I can understand you know that people then tend to not 
know very much about how cosmopolitan Africa actually is. Um, and that's fine. I mean, you know, kind of Africa is in the process of telling its stories and, you know, people will learn more about Africa as time goes on. But it is a very cosmopolitan place and South Africa is an extremely cosmopolitan place. Um, so my family has been in South Africa for about 250 years, roughly. Um, that we really came, you know, kind of a, in the the very early parts of European colonization. Um, and since then, you know, my family has been here. So I count myself as South African, um, but I can also understand, you know, that that being a white South African is its own can of worms and it's its own complicated situation. So, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm willing to kind of discuss my, my identity. Um, but yeah, that, that is how I think about myself is as a white South African. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because when we started this, I am white myself. I'm from the United States. Um, and when we started this, this project, I actually was bracing for quite a bit of resentment or hostility or negativity from, you know, any of the different quarters we talk about, whether it's the Chinese who often can be very sensitive about, uh, you know, foreigners talking about China, certainly different African communities, both on the continent, as well as the diaspora can be very sensitive about this. Americans are highly sensitive about being criticized, uh, you know, particularly from one of their own. And so what surprised me a little bit is how not that we've escaped the criticism, but I thought it would be far more personal. And what I'm very excited about is that the criticisms that come towards us tend to be more about the ideas and the talking points and less about us. And I think that is something that uh, I take great pride in and something that we try very, very hard to not make this personal about us in that sense. I mean, beyond we want the ideas to kind of stand forth. Uh, rather than our ethnicity or our race. And, and I think that's very interesting. And that comes from a little bit of, of my own background, which has been working and living in, uh, in Africa, in Europe, and now in Asia for most of my career. Uh, as a journalist, um, I've been, I started my career uh, with the BBC World Service in China back in 1992. Uh, in fact, I started even earlier than that in 1989 as an overnight news anchor in Taiwan at the only American radio station there called ICRT. For some of you Taiwan geeks out there, you'll know that channel. Then later I moved to Hong Kong where I was an, uh, an anchor for Metro News. And that was back during the colonial period when English language news was very, very popular. Uh, over the years, I've worked at CNN, BBC, the Associated Press, CNBC. Um, I was the f editor-in-chief of digital content at uh, France 24 in Paris. I've been a journalist for Radio France International. And most recently here in Vietnam, where I live now with my family, I was the uh, general director of FBNC, Financial Business News Channel, which is the largest uh, all business news network, uh, cable TV network in Vietnam. And now uh, for the past year, I've been the digital director and the chief revenue officer for Ringier Vietnam when I've been the digital director for Elle Magazine, the global fashion magazine. So uh, I have a background in media and journalism. I majored in African history at uh, the University of California, Berkeley, and then later got a master's in Chinese foreign policy at the University of Hong Kong. So that's a little bit, I'm coming from the more conventional journalism side. Kobus has spent time both in journalism and academia, but it gives you a little bit of a sense of, of where we're coming from and what we're trying to do. Kobus, let's now, I guess that answers the questions. Do you have any other questions that you think people would be interested in me? Um, no, maybe, maybe more uh, j just, um, how did you come to China, Africa issues in the first ah, place? What, what, what okay. kicked that off? Yeah. So I spent most of my career doing international journalism in Asia, uh, foreign correspondent in Tokyo for the AP, uh, producer for CNN in Hong Kong, reporter for the BBC in China. I've been studying Chinese since I was 15 years old in high school. It's been 32 years now, uh, that I've been studying Chinese. Um, I speak it and write it and read it fluently. Um, and so my background actually is on the China side of the story. Uh, but then in 2005, my brother was r uh, running a company in Kinshasa, and he was producing soap operas, uh, a show called Rien que la vérité, uh, Nothing but the Truth, and that was funded by the U.S. State Department and PEPFAR money. And over the years from 2005 to 2010, his show became increasingly popular and it was getting larger and more money was coming into it. Sponsors were coming into it. Uh, more aid money and more State Department money was coming into it. 
And so he needed some help to run the company. So I'd been going back and forth uh, to, to Congo, to the DRC from 2005 to 2010 to see my brother. And the first time I went in 2005 in Kinshasa, there was only one Chinese restaurant right there in Gombe. Uh, and, you know, well, every country in the world, every city in the world, major city has a Chinese restaurant. So I didn't really strike me as that interesting. But nonetheless, you know, took a picture in front of the Chinese restaurant, thought it was cool. I go back in 2006, there's two Chinese restaurants. I thought, that's kind of neat. Hmm. Okay. Well, there we go. Two pictures now in front of the restaurants. Mm -hmm. By 2007, 2008, something very profound was starting to happen. There were Chinese people all over. Roads were being built. There was movement. And all I could see in the international press, when I mean that, I mean the, the Western press, the FT, the Wall Street Journal, Fast Company, um, you know, the New York Times, was this very, very aggressive narrative. China is colonizing Africa. China is devouring Africa. And while that may have been the case, and I, I didn't question that too much, what I was hearing from people on the ground in Kinshasa was a much more nuanced story was, you know, people were saying, yeah, I like the Chinese. I like the fact that I have a road now, but I don't like the fact that I see some of their workers that are here. I like the fact that the Chinese are here, but I don't like the fact that I heard that they paid Joseph Kabila hundreds of millions of dollars for mining rights in the East. You know, and it was this very, very complicated, you know, understanding of the China-Africa story that I wasn't seeing in the foreign press. So I thought, you know what, this is really neat. Here I am on the ground in Kinshasa. Let me start writing about this. And so I started focusing on the gray, not the black, not the white, not the China side, not the Africa side, not the Western side, but where I enjoy the most is that middle space, which is complicated and nuanced. And that's one of the things that we try and do here is we point out that there are some parts of every part of the story that we support or that we criticize. And, and I try to poke holes in the narratives that each actor has in this, some of the hypocrisy of it all. That is the Americans who will talk about democracy yet support the Ethiopian government, or they talk about freedom and yet support, you know, less democratic regimes. They will talk about, you know, nonviolence and then send in, you know, weapon sales throughout the continent, all these different things. Or they talk about human rights and our own country's human rights problems are not addressed. And that's the hypocrisy. For the Africans, Kobus, you're brilliant on this subject. And you talk about the narrative of African victimization and the lack of agency, that Africans are always being, something's being done to them. And that idea that they are disempowered. And we don't, you know, that's the idea that I really try to go after, you know. And then for the Chinese, it's this win-win that, you know, they're this poor third world developing country and they're kind of aligning themselves with other poor third world developing countries and they're just trying to help when in fact we know their agenda is far more complicated than that. And so I started kind of blogging and writing about it. And then after Kinshasa, I moved to Paris where I started reporting for Radio France International, which is purportedly a radio station that's kind of heavily obsessed with Africa. You know, the French, it's just, it's really a, an obsession. And, but I, I have to say, it's not Africa they're obsessed with. They're obsessed with French Africa. And so I started pitching stories in the editorial meetings at RFI and saying that, you know, these big China stories were going on. And it was amazing to see the instinctive, guttural, emotive response from the senior news editorial staff. Oh, the Chinese, they're just there to colonize Africa. That's not a story. And I got so pissed off and angry by that, that response that they wouldn't even consider the story. But it's, it's, such said, a, it's such a weird response because, I mean, if someone else is trying to colonize Africa, isn't that a big story? <laughs> it, well, it just it, – it's bizarre. And they, will, and they will afford so much coverage to anything that happens in French Africa. So French West – you know, French West Africa, French-speaking Africa, Francophone Africa. So Mali, Central African Republic, Gabon get disproportionate amount of coverage because of the Francophone bias. And I just got really frustrated with that. So I decided that, you know what, I don't need you to do these stories. So I went home and I called up a bunch of the professors out of the RFI kind of database. And I said, I'm going to start this podcast and I want to talk to you about what the Chinese are doing. And I was kind of leveraging my experience in China, my experience in, in the DRC. And to my surprise, they were all like, yeah, sure, I'll talk to you. That's cool. Let's, yeah. let's do it. And that's when I started podcasting, but I, I didn't have enough time because I was working full time, but I wanted to do this. And so that's when I went out into Twitter and I said, does anybody want to help me with the podcast? 
And lo and behold, you know, that was 2010. You kind of answered that tweet. And I was like, okay. And we had met each other uh, up until last year. So we yeah. went six years of doing the show, 52 weeks a year. And in the beginning, we did two shows a week uh, for six years and never having met one another. Yeah, that was really, it's really funny. Um, and, you know, once once we once we really started working together, then we developed this thing where we try to, to cast the net as wide as possible, to try and get as many different actors in the China-Africa space as possible. So because we are, we both come from media and from journalism, we, we got a lot of journalists, you know, among others, because they are on the front lines covering a lot of this stuff. And also a lot of academics for the same reason, because frequently the academics are the ones who are doing the field work, they are out there, like, driving out to the to the the building site seeing what is actually being built but then we started actually getting so many more kinds of people including business people and students and even high schoolers um you know kind of all busy with little other all kinds of little contributions to china africa relations in 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 in, the, in many many different ways and it, it became this interesting challenge to try and get as many kinds of different professions as possible. And, and that's one of the reasons why we actually go out of our way to not use a lot of shorthand or jargon, in part because we're, we know we're reaching a very, very diverse audience, both geographically but also linguistically. So a lot of people uh, do not speak English for their first language. Uh, and I, I work in a, in, a, in, a, in a foreign country where I don't speak the language, and I know how difficult it is for people to understand when I speak in a Vietnamese environment. And so one of the things that we try to do on the show is to make it as accessible as possible, both for people who don't speak native English, because uh, our number one download destination for the website or for the podcast is uh, Virginia. <laughs> so people in Washington are listening to the show, which is very exciting. Our number two no most downloaded destination is Beijing. And I think that is absolutely fascinating. So probably a lot of expats in Beijing are listening to the show, but I'm hoping that also uh, Chinese are listening to the show. And that's really one of our objectives is to connect Chinese and uh, Africans and people from around the world to kind of exchange some of these ideas. So, okay, Kobus, let's talk about uh, the issue that comes up probably now more than, than, than in the past few years, which is, um, you know, our funding. So... Who are who? How are we? How who, how do who pays for all this? We've been doing this for six or seven years. It costs a couple thousand dollars a year for us to put on the website, the hosting, all the equipment that we use to buy it. Talk to. Let's talk about money. Uh, the short answer is no one funds us at the moment. Like we we are self funded, um, and we do um, we do it because we love to do it, and we because we would like to to expand the conversation about China Africa relations. We have in the past done a collaboration uh, with Wits University, where we got a little bit of funding via them from Open Society Foundation. Um, and we are again, uh, uh, we are we go through a process of of applying for funding at the moment. So if that funding situation changes, we will make that clear. Um, you know, we are open to being funded. We just haven't found the right the right funding situation. However, the right, we are. Yeah, the, sorry, let just, me just, just sorry to interrupt you. The right funding situation is something that's really important here. We don't want to take any advertising from, say, a Chinese company. We wouldn't want to necessarily take any funding from the U.S. State Department, who oftentimes funds these kinds of initiatives for kind of for media. So if people bring us offers for, for funding, um, we're very, very discriminating. We don't actually need the money. It would be nice to get compensated for this, but we can do this without any, any outside funding. And that's what we've been doing. There, Cobus and I split all of the expenses 50-50. Um, and so sorry to interrupt you there. I just wanted to kind of make that point there. And I mean, we managed to do that because we have day jobs. So, um, you know, if, if, if at some stage we, we hope, to, and that is what we hope to do, but if at some stage we get the chance to, to, to grow the China Africa project 
even bigger than it is now, then we might have to have more conversations about about possible options. Um, but as as it stands at the moment, we we draw a lot of um, of strength from the idea that we are completely impartial um, yeah. and that we can we can talk at, about anyone we want to and we can say whatever we want to. Um, so, you know, so yeah, so so that that is I, I think to a, a large extent our selling point is that we really, we're not affiliated with anyone. Yeah. So let me read an email. And this is kind of typical of the mail that we get on this subject. And it's it's pretty consistent. Uh, this was forwarded to me from uh, our good friend Deborah Braudigam at uh, Johns Hopkins University. I won't say the name because it's really not important. But uh, let me just read a, a paragraph and, a, and, and, and then we'll talk about it. Uh, so the, the student at Johns Hopkins writing to Deborah Braudigam says, quote, I have also discovered the China Africa project and noticed that it appears to broadcast a very pro China opinion. I also cannot ascertain information on how this enterprise is funded. I have encountered no advertisements, invitations to donate, or disclosures of parent organizations. I'm relatively new to Chinese foreign policy, but I am inclined to think that this is a propaganda outlet funded by China. <laughs> and uh, let me just read another example and then we'll, we'll kind of discuss. So this is from Facebook. Um, I recognize the tone of your comments, and since you are the moderator of this site, the Facebook page, I can determine that the bias of this site is pro-China and not neutral. I will unfollow your site, and I don't want to bother your agenda with opinions, insight, or experience. Best of luck to you in promoting your cause. And and this is very interesting. Now, because so, I so am. You think like they they see we have that China propaganda flair <laughs> that that's that, right. that, that fine handed and, the media production that China's propaganda always has, <laughs> which is which is kind of funny because the way I responded to the student at Johns Hopkins University was our shows on the Dalai Lama in South Africa, the shows on Taiwan in Nigeria, the shows you know criticizing Chinese human rights abuses, uh, supporting Chinese human rights abuses in Ethiopia with the telecom by a report done by Human Rights Watch. Uh, you know, accusations of Chinese illegal arms sales to South Sudan, you know, and I said, bam, 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 all these different shows that we do. Uh, and, and he was very apologetic and he, you know, wrote me an email. But that that's kind of not the point. The issue here, which I think is so interesting, and I think this particularly comes from Westerners, Europeans and Americans, who are not accustomed to hearing any defense of the Chinese. So I don't have any agenda, horse in the race. I got no stake in whether the Chinese are favored or not favored, look good or don't look good. But it is intellectually dishonest to say that everything the Chinese do is bad. And one of the things in the discourse in the United States in particular, because that's the media I follow most closely, is you actually never, ever really hear anything that shows some of the positive things that the Chinese are doing. So, for example, when the Chinese took down uh, tariffs on 4,000 African agricultural products, but yet the Europeans and Americans continue to have lots of agricultural uh, tariffs. Um, that's a that's a just outright great thing to do. Um, we can go through a list of positive things that the Chinese have done. We've talked about how China has brought more people out of poverty in a shorter period of time than any other country in human history. That is an accomplishment that should be celebrated. They've educated more girls than any country in human history in a shorter period of time. So there are a lot of good. Now, that said, and if you're a listener to the show, a regular listener to the show, you will hear us criticize vehemently uh, you know, Chinese arrogance on their foreign policy. If you look on our, on our Facebook page, we've just recently posted kind of a discussion on how the Chinese, you know, they, they instinctively blame foreigners for not understanding you know, what they're doing in Africa. And we said, that's ridiculous. A lot of it has to do with some of their very botched policies. We've talked with Howard French about how the the loans really are not always in China, in Africa's best interest, as that's all money going back to, to China. So we believe in really trying to kind of highlight the good and criticize the bad. But it's interesting because whenever we criticize, whenever we highlight the good, we are accused of being panda huggers and pro-China and propagandists. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. I mean, we also really criticize the West a lot, um, you know, and I tend to also criticize Africa a lot because I, I frequently think that African governments are not really 
that there's you know not to not to be a person who quotes George, the, the you know George W. Bush, but there is this kind of um, you know bigotry of low expectations happening in you know in, in discussion of Africa. Like if you know you know. Uh, where African countries are just held to much lower standards than other countries, um, and African governments are just people just assume that they're dysfunctional, um, without wondering why, you know, or how the system works or how the power works um, in those particular governments. So, so I think I think we tend to be pretty tough on everyone, actually. Um, well, that's our goal. Planning. That's the goal, at least. But also to to praise when necessary as well. I mean, we really want to bring the nuance to the issue. That's, you know, if people only listen to one show and they may not hear one or the other side, they can come to a conclusion very quickly. The last point I want to make on this, and I, I think it, it's very interesting, particularly for you as a media scholar, is how discourse and discussion has changed in the past, you know, one to two years. So it was really interesting from this commentator on Facebook. And, and again, these are only Americans. We have a community of almost a quarter of a million people. And I only see this behavior from Americans. It may happen with other people, but I'm just saying that in our case, Americans do this, which is, I disagree with you, and therefore I'm going to unfollow your site. That's what he said. I will yeah, unfollow I your page. Yeah, and yeah. that actually really made me sad. Um, I, I was very disappointed when he said that because I was putting forward what I thought were kind of, you know, not hyperbolic kind of counterpoints. It was a discussion, and I love the discussion. So if you post on Facebook, you will kind of get a guaranteed response from me within a couple of hours. And it, I always try to make it a thoughtful response. It may not agree with you, but there's always a thoughtful response because we want to engage in debate, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's by email. And, and when people say, I'm just checking out because you're, you know, you're not part of my information bubble. You're not affirming everything I say. You're not, you know, the confirmation bias that I seek in my news. Um, that that just, yeah, I mean, it just bumps me out and it just makes well, me I mean, sad it, because, you it's know. It's the silo effect, you know, kind of like the, the, the there's been a lot of, of uh, media studies research done on this over the last two or three years. Um, like, you know, pe people in, on social media tend to cluster with people who think like them. And so they become used to not being contradicted. Um, yeah. And they, they don't actually have discussions, you know, like people people in the past have always thought that places like Twitter or Facebook is going to be spaces where people, where ideas can be discussed, but they're not. You know, they're, they're actually places where certain where ideas are confirmed um, and that people self-select to to avoid people that they don't uh, agree with. Um, you know, so, so I think, yeah, that we, we, we hear, see, you know, in, in miniature something that, that is actually true, I think, of a lot of social media as a whole. And, and I'm making a plea uh, for everybody listening to the show and anybody who participates, uh, you know, in discussions with us on Twitter or on Facebook – uh, or via email, uh, please engage us. We love it. We genuinely love the discussion. We don't want you to agree with us. We want you to send your your darts our way. That you something that we said that you don't like, uh, that you think is you know is biased or you think is unfair, whatever. Uh, and you'll you'll get a good response from us. So if you like discussion and you want some opinions, we help a lot of students with you know paper ideas and topics. We help journalists to frame stories. We work even. I've, on occasion, I've worked with some diplomats to help them frame some issues. And, and that discussion is really what we like. And we invite you to, uh, to reach out to us. You know, uh, so I'll just give our emails out, which is eric at chinaafricaproject.com and cobus, C-O-B-U-S, at chinaafricaproject.com. So let us know what you want. Okay, Cobus, let's wrap this show up because it's gone on actually much longer than I thought it would. Let's look a little bit to the future, what we've got planned. Uh, we got some big plans coming up and uh, some life-changing plans actually on my side. But uh, what's the biggest one that we're going to be working on very soon? We are at the moment in the process of conceptualizing a book. So it is still very early days. We're not exactly sure how it's going to be and where it's going to come from and what it's going to say. But we are working together on some kind of book that we hope will be useful to especially a new China Africa people who are joining the China Africa community uh, you know as we speak uh, people who are interested in, in it now as a new topic um, and yeah so so we'll let you know how it develops as it goes on 
So we are, uh, I'm actually quitting my job to write this book with Cobus, uh, which is very exciting, a little bit scary, but living here in Saigon, uh, it's a great place to live. It's, you know, it's extremely affordable. And so uh, this is the one of those once in a lifetime opportunities, very excited to, to, to kind of write this. And I'm also going to be writing more for the Huffington Post, which we write for every week. Uh, China file on the Asia Society's platform, uh, obviously for our, my LinkedIn pro, you know community, which I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are a part of. We have 210,000 now, which is really exciting. Um, so a lot more writing. We're going to also do the book in Chinese for a Chinese audience, and that will require some adaptation of the book to get past the Chinese censorship. But we feel that making that editorial compromise um, is important to try and bring these ideas into the intellectual ecosystem in China. And that is so important because oftentimes because of the the, the idea firewalls that are surrounding China uh, on many of these concepts, uh, f- few of them actually get through. And so we want to, to reach out and, and do the story in Chinese uh, as well as in English for a global audience. Uh, we will continue to do the show every week. We have great guests. We'd love your opinions. If you also are doing something interesting in the China-Africa space, uh, reach out to us. If you're a student doing a paper, we love to have students. In fact, you know, I always find it funny, Copas, that some of our most popular shows in terms of numbers of downloads and feedback that we get are when we feature high school and college students on the program. It's really, and I think that's because a lot of people listening to this are young people. And people love to hear how the differences are between how a young person frames these issues and how an old person frames it. And I mean an old person is anybody over 40. I wrote a blog post uh, oh, four or five years ago that said that if you're over 40, you don't get China Africa because <laughs> you're burdened with so much of the kind of, you know, archaic way of thinking about these two regions, you know, that Except the Chinese the two are. Us, right? <laughs> well, that's right. I mean, we're, I'm well over 40, so we're, you know, we're the exceptions, I hope. But uh, um, so reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, give some final thoughts before we say goodbye. Yeah, I mean, I hope that um, that our kind of crazy obsession in diving into this this niche um, is helping people. Um, and I think I, I hope it is like you know, kind of I, I hope it's bringing some kind of new view of the world or some kind of new information that is interesting. Um, and yeah, we'll keep doing it. We will keep doing it. We want to. You know, we really want to, I think, on behalf of Cobus, uh, you know, extend just a very warm thank you for everybody who has supported us over the years. Um, You know, the community keeps growing. Our listenership keeps growing. People give us more feedback and and, they say they enjoy the shows. Um, So we just we're really grateful that you enjoy it. We hope that you enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, well, please do let us know. And and we're we're very responsive that way. Uh, So we're going to continue to do it. And we just hope that this show here was an opportunity to introduce a little bit about us, who we are, why we're doing this, how we're funded, uh, what agendas we have, which are really just to, to spark discussion and ideas. So we'll continue to produce a show every single week throughout the year. Uh, so until next week, we'll be back with another edition, back to a normal edition of the China in Africa podcast. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show or follow China Africa News that's updated every four hours, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadenesk or Eric at Eolander. That's E-O-L-A-N-D-E-R. Subscribe to the China Africa podcast on iTunes or download the mobile apps for iOS, Android, or Windows Phone. Just head over to your favorite store and search for China Africa. 